All right, guys, so we are going to talk a little bit about oxygen therapy today. That's why it's entitled Just a Little Oxygen, because in no way, shape, or form is this all-inclusive. Um, you guys know this by now. You can be on oxygen pretty much for days on end. So we're actually going to have just a little bit of focus here on some of the prime concepts that you are going to encounter very soon. And so for overview, we're just going to do a quick anatomy we're going to talk a little bit about foreign body, sinus infections, obstructive sleep apnea, fractures, tonsillitis, and epiglottitis. All right, I am a visual person, so I love um, to see things in action. Um, and so I really want you guys to understand that we're focused really right about here, right around the larynx slash vocal cord area and up. So really upper airway is what we're focused on here. Um, of course, epiglottitis is in there, tonsillitis is in there, all kinds of things, but it's basically vocal cords and up. So the first thing we're going to talk about is foreign body. And just like the name foreign, not supposed to be there, this is something that is not supposed to show up in the airway, y'all, okay? Examples of this would be toys, small hard foods like popcorn, round hard candy, and yes, even coins. This little uh, person right here actually swallowed a nickel. Um, this is showing up on x-ray where it's at in the airway, and this is showing an actual visualization of the nickel itself. And so it's really kind of interesting. And then they have cleared out the nickel at this point. Um, but as you can see, this is a child. And so who is at most risk for this? That would be children. Children love to shove things in their nose. Um, they love to swallow things they're not supposed to, especially toddlers. They're very good at counter surfing and pulling off things from the counter. And then of course they have to taste them because they feel like that's what exactly they're supposed to do. Um, and of course, this causes obstruction, right? This causes an obstruction, especially in their little tiny airways. And so assessment, basically always and forever, when we're talking about oxygen assessment, hypoxia, agitation, and restlessness, you guys know that that should be um, one of the first things that we think about because when a patient is not getting enough oxygen, they become agitated, restless, anxious, et cetera. So those are kind of always your first um, assessment pieces so you can determine the extent of the obstruction. The other thing that we're gonna look for is use of accessory muscles. So these would be the rib or intercostal muscles. This would be um, up in the sternocleomastoid, uh, anywhere that they have to use extra muscles to pull in air. That's what you want to look for. And then the word strider I have here in very big letters, and that is because strider is one of your number one symptoms of an airway obstruction. Hear me again. Strider is one of your number one symptoms of airway obstruction, okay? Because basically strider is that noise that air is making as it passes over whatever object or um, it could be anatomy when we talk about epiglottitis here in a few minutes, but anything that it's passing over, it's gonna make that striderous noise, inhale and exhale, but strider in general, okay? And then, of course, our priorities for the foreign body would be to assess and correct the cause. This particular child had an endoscopy. They went in, retrieved the nickel, life went on. Sometimes they will monitor the foreign body if it's not causing a complete obstruction. And sometimes the body can process it all the way through the GI system. It just really depends on the size of the object that gets swallowed. Next, we're going to move on to sinusitis, which is just a sinus infection or inflammation of the sinuses. Our most common complaint that you're going to see with this will be facial pain and pressure, as well as post-nasal drainage. And so what I've included for you here is a picture of the sinuses. Again, I think once you connect with it visually, it makes a little more sense. So you see these pockets right here. These are your major sinus cavities. And guess what? If you push on those areas on your face, they tend to hurt or they're sore or they're swollen during a sinus infection. 
And so that's why um, I think the visual is important for you guys to understand where sinusitis actually impacts it. Um, if you've been lucky enough never to have a sinus infection, good for you. Um, and of course, you see the green drainage that's hanging out in her sinus cavities. That's where the post-nasal drainage comes from. Um, these upper cavities tend to drain into the back of the throat. Um, oftentimes, this does require an antibiotic, but there are some independent nursing actions that you can take for this. Um, and because you're in nursing school or have graduated nursing school, we want to know what you would do as a nurse, okay? We're not interested in medical interventions. We're interested in what you as the nurse can do for this patient. And so if you think again about the location of sinuses, warm, moist compresses to the face. Warm steam inhalation to help break up that inflammation and those secretions. Keeping the head of the bed elevated for drainage purposes. You can do saline irrigation. Of course, ask them to increase fluids, which happens to be a good answer in general. Um, I joke with people sometimes that small frequent meals and increasing fluids are like your two go-tos in nursing. And then of course, avoid smoking because smoking causes vasoconstriction. And the last thing those sinuses need are more constriction and inflammation. All right, next we're gonna move on to obstructive sleep apnea. It is a stopping of breathing during sleep for at least 10 seconds. And it usually occurs several times an hour. Usually, um, I think the book says five times per hour. Um, we have some very distinct risk factors that put people at high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. That would be obesity, short neck, large tonsils and adenoids. Smoking, of course, is always a good answer when it comes to health maintenance. Um, but I've included a picture for you guys here, Big Ed. Um, <laughs> you guys may have seen it in the Facebook group, but Big Ed is basically a walking poster child for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the issues that come along with obstructive sleep apnea happen to do with the oxygen and gas exchange, right? So if there's no oxygen coming in, Therefore, there's no carbon dioxide going out. So we decrease oxygen levels, increase CO2 levels, which then turn in, turns into a respiratory acidosis. So very harmful on patients. Um, I often hear our patients, oh, I just have sleep apnea. But sleep apnea is really serious. There are people that have died in their sleep related to complications of obstructive sleep apnea. And so some of our biggest problems that we face would be hypertension, I've seen patients have strokes related to sleep apnea, right-sided heart failure, and then cardiac dysrhythmias. So not just the sleep apnea, it's actually a very um, impactful thing. Um, the problem with obstructive sleep apnea is there's not really a whole lot of nursing interventions that need to be done. Uh, basically, what we can do as nurses is um, assess from the patient their sleeping patterns, do they frequently wake up? Are they waking up tired? Are they sleepy during the day? All those symptoms that will tell us that it could be sleep apnea. And then we plan for a sleep study. Um, your biggest thing with obstructive sleep apnea is making sure you understand what it is, what the risk factors are, and then what are the potential outcomes. Because at the end of the day, um, the NCLEX wants to know that you as a nurse can provide proper education on health promotion and maintenance. Hopefully that makes sense um, because teaching is an independent nursing action. We talked about that um, in the question yesterday, that teaching shows up in every single one of the nursing scope of practice in the United States. So every state you can teach. All right, nasal fractures. This is going to be an injury to um, the nasal area, and it's either going to be displaced or it's not. So it's either going to impair gas exchange and cause airway obstruction, or it's not. Sometimes it's just cosmetic, which means girlfriend's got a crooked nose, okay? So it can really be that simple. Um, the problem is we want to escalate it to the point of what do we need to know the complications of? And so our biggest issue is going to be obstruction and gas exchange. And so, of course, our very first assessment is going to be airway. Um, airway, airway, airway. We want to make sure they're getting enough air in, they're exchanging enough gas in order to maintain homeostasis. Remember, acid base, homeostasis. Um, we also want to look for changes in breathing pattern. 
Does it cause them to use those accessory muscles? Does it come, cause them to become distressed or hypoxic? And then we're gonna assess for a CSF or cerebral spinal fluid leak, okay? And the way I remember this is CSF has glucose and snot does not. I'll say that again. <laughs> cerebral spinal fluid or CSF has glucose and snot does not. Okay, so anytime you have a nasal fracture and they have clear nasal drainage, do the right thing. Check it for the halo when it dries or check it for glucose to make sure that they do not have a brain injury on top of this nasal fracture. Um, so very, very important to remember that. All right, good old tonsillitis. I hope you're not eating for this one because this is pure gross, but tonsillitis is an inflammation or infection of the tonsils. It may require antibiotics, specifically when we're talking about strep throat, um, or it could require a tonsillectomy if this continues to be an issue over time. Um, so for assessment findings, of course, we would want to test it to see if it is strep versus something else, assess the redness drainage and if they can swallow. And of course, you can see these tonsils. These tonsils are extremely swollen. The uvula is extremely swollen. This airway has got, like kind of cut in half here, if you notice that. Um, so we have to be very, very careful that they're still able to breathe as well. Remember any sort of obstruction, we are worried about strider. Okay, so don't forget any sort of obstruction, we're worried about strider. We're also going to assess the child or adult for fever, cough, and tonsillar exudate, which happens to be these white, yellowish, lovely things on these tonsils. Um, sometimes they can be tonsil stones, but that's not a conversation that we really want to talk about right now. This is more exudate or that pus kind of look on the tonsils. So if we go down the path of a tonsillectomy, there are a couple of things that we need to remember. Um, and our big ones is going to be about the airway, right? We've just had surgery on the airway. So we want to make sure that they can clear secretions, um, that you have suction equipment available. Uh, um, we want to use ice in general, either ice chips, or you can even do ice compresses to the neck. The other thing with positioning, you want this child or young adult or whomever you're taking care of, you want them to be positioned on their side or prone. And the purpose of that is for secretions. There's gonna be a lot of drainage happening, a lot of stuff going on in the throat. Um, and if you put the child supine or on their back, they have a high risk of aspiration. So please, please, please put that patient on their side or prone, have that suction equipment available. The other thing that we are going to do is we are going to assess for continuous swallowing, okay? Children are notorious for just swallowing things down as they come up in their throat. When that happens, continuous swallowing is often associated with bleeding. I'll say that again, continuous swallowing especially after an upper airway surgery, tonsils, rhinoplasty, any of those. Continuous swallowing could indicate bleeding. Bleeding is bad, okay? That's when we wanna call somebody and get some intervention done and apply those ice packs. So continuous swallowing, we're worried about bleeding, okay? The other thing that I learned um, the hard way, I remember growing up, people always said, uh, get your tonsils out. You can have all the ice cream you can eat. Wrong. Uh -uh. No milk products for these patients, okay? I don't think you're going to see much about that. Um, but in case you do, just keep it in the back of your mind that milk causes a thickening of, of um, saliva, can cause patients to have to clear their throat, which further irritates the surgical site. So. Stick with ice, ice chips, popsicles, anything kind of clear liquid uh, without all that thickening. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about here is epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is an airway emergency. It is considered bacterial croup, um, and it causes swelling of the epiglottis. And what I've done is I've actually gotten an x-ray um, picture to show you. This is the epiglottis. Look how massive that is. A normal epiglottis just should kind of sit here like a little bubble. 
but this is almost obstructing this airway. Look how far into that airway this epiglottis is, all right? So it can be a very abrupt onset bacterial croup, um, and it is an airway emergency. Because of this bacterial croup, we have to do airway management and antibiotics ASAP, period. Um, those, again, are medical interventions. So let's talk a little bit about the nursing side of it because you are in nursing school. So assessment, of course, we're going to assess for the work of breathing. We're looking for drooling and inspiratory strider. Drooling and inspiratory strider, okay? If you're looking at a question and you're looking at symptoms and you see drooling and inspiratory strider, your brain should go to epiglottitis. These are the two classic symptoms of epiglottitis, drooling and inspiratory strider. And then of course, agitation because the patient can't breathe. Um, high fever because we're dealing with a bacterial infection. So your priorities for this patient is NPO. And when I say NPO, that means nothing in the mouth at all. No oral temperatures, no food, no having them say ah, no trying to visualize the throat. You don't want to do any of that because that's going to continue to make the epiglottis swell. It's going to cause more inflammation, more problems than good. So don't do it. Nothing by mm -hmm. mouth. Nothing in the mouth, period. Um, the other thing you're going to do is actually have the emergency equipment available, including an emergency airway, because one of two things is going to happen. If we don't get steroids, antibiotics, and fluids on board fast enough, this, this epiglottis is going to continue to swell. They're going to lose their airway, and then we have to either put in a trach or do an emergency intubation. Okay. Um, and again, <laughs> this is another kind of concept that, that flows among multiple uh, concepts here is that when a child loses the sounds, so all of a sudden you have, the, have this child, they're in a tripod position, they're drooling, they have inspiratory strider, they're freaking out on you. If you stop hearing the noise, if the strider stops, there is a high chance that that airway has completely collapsed, okay? And then that is a complete emergency situation. Um, so as a recap, this is all about airway, um, obstructive sleep apnea, make sure you know your risk factors and uh, common complications, tonsillitis, epiglottitis, um, you want to remember continuous swallowing, drooling, and inspiratory strider, okay? So hopefully this has helped you guys focus and um, let me know if you found it helpful.